Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so humbled by these passages that we have heard. We're humbled um, to stand under them and to have them shape our lives is pure gift from your hands and Holy Spirit. We ask you to do that work. Take our lives and shape them by these words. And if in the process you choose to use this servant, we give you thanks for that. But in all things, we ask that your will would be done, your work would be done in us. And so in us, open a way to hear and to respond to this life-giving word. In Jesus' name. So when I was in the parish, I loved All Saints Day because we would baptize new members, whether those were adults or children, and we would remember those who had gone on to be with the Lord. Um, usually there was a freshness about that last bit because we had buried some of the saints of the church in that given year. But it was a picture of hope, right? It's a picture of hope for these, whether it's a new life in the Lord or a new life period that we were welcoming into the community of faith through baptism, or it was um, <clears throat> anticipation of this communion with those who had gone before. And so we would sing great hymns of praise in the church. and. It was my joy to remind them that we are now joining angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. It is like chocolate cheesecake. Yet at the same time, what crept into the day is something that I think happens all the time in the Church of God, and that is that there is a kind of comparison that goes on and it's maybe out of our insecurity or or wonky theology but it's a sense that these saints who we remember the ones that were in the scriptures the ones that tradition holds up to us are somehow super christians that there is somehow in the christian church a kind of um, class of saints Right? that there, these folks have something inherently better about their nature or their character. And so rather than these, these folks being these ones who are sort of held out to us by the scriptures and by the church, instead of them being an encouragement to us, we actually walk away a bit dejected and discouraged. And we... That kind of comparison, I think that's just one of the things that kind of creeps into a day like this and perhaps robs it a little bit of its joy. But it forgets the fact that any measure of holiness is actually not this way at all, right? It's not horizontal at all. Any measure of our holiness, any comparison is with the Lord himself. And in that case, we are all wanting, even the saints of the church, and the saints of the scriptures. And it misses that a deep dive into the life of the saints gives us a picture of a group of followers who, if they do anything of worth, anything of worth, it's because they're animated by a gospel, whether it's an anticipation of that reality or the reality itself that has undone them and remade them for service to a king who is the one by the power of his spirit who animates them, who emboldens them, enables them, empowers them, and leads them. And that's what these scriptures are going to point us to over and over again today. They're going to share with, uh, they're going to take us to places where we are going to see in them our shared core identity as the saints of God. We are going to, in that community of saints, we are going to acknowledge that followership as saints in the church of God means shared suffering. And that we are also, they will draw our imaginations and praise towards a shared future. 
that speaks a profound word of hope into our present realities. So these scriptures are going to speak to us about a shared identity in the communion of saints, a shared suffering, and a shared future. So first of all, as we are looking, we acknowledge, right? You guys are theology scholars. You are biblical scholars. Communion of saints, the saints of the church of God, the people who acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is God's Messiah and God's rescue for the world. That through his death and resurrection, we are joined together and we are in union not only with him, but with each other. Right? And so that reality then shapes our identity. We can use a word, sort of communion is, uh, it comes from the Latin word that is having in common, and sometimes we use the word fellowship or koinonia to describe that, but I'm not sure that that, for me at least, okay, so speaking for myself, I don't doesn't give me quite the sense of uh, gravitas as the word union does. When Jesus is talking in John 7 about being one with him and then one with another as a result of our unity with him. Right? And that union, that's the union that shapes us. Union with him and his death and resurrection. That's what brings this communion into existence. That's what shapes us. That's what forms us. Revelation 7 points to it. It speaks of the saints who worship at the foot of the throne on which the Lamb, which the Lord Jesus Christ sits, and it names the identity of these and all the identity that all saints share. Who are these ones, the elder asks. And John replies, you know. And so he responds, yes. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is no other way to stand in this august presence, to even be in this august presence. All of us are in need of a washing that no human cleansing or detergent could achieve, no human effort at good living, no amount of moral rectitude. This is the work of another at great cost, the shedding of blood, the lamb sacrificed. Even that amazing treasure trove that almost makes you weep when you read it or hear it out of Ephesians 1. That inheritance of the saints comes to us through one way, and that is shed blood. And that shapes our identity as the communion of saints. And it's a leveling thing. It's a leveling identity. Communion with others washed in this way is a humble company. And thank goodness that's the narrative, not this other comparison. Because it better fits the truth, tr truest truths about us, the church of Jesus Christ. Because when we look at the saints of God, the people of God, we see our failures and how we work out our brokenness on each other, how we cling to our pride and our rights, how we shame and judge. Our faithfulness often is in fits and starts, our own church leaders have feet of clay, and we're disappointed and angry and deeply sad that we aren't a better testimony. And we as the church of God are healthiest when we come to terms with that reality. When we wrestle with the fact that our communities of faith, including the clergy who lead them, are full up of wretched sinners saved by grace. It's then that we begin to find true community of humility and grace being formed in our churches. All Saints is an invitation to kneel at the foot of the lamb, the lamb slain, whose blood, shed blood, is our making, our formation, our ongoing res resume of faith and our hope and there to quiet our hearts before him, to lay down all comparisons to any other, and there to start being church. Because this is a community of saints who will suffer. The truest truth of our reality of being God's broken people living in a broken world is not triumphalness, 
triumphalism. It's not up and to the right progress. It's not your best life now. The truest truth is that our King Jesus has turned the power narrative of the world on its head. And we who follow him and seek to live by his way too often find ourselves bruised by that same world. Some of us will even lose our lives as a result of our followership. It is a shared suffering. So we have a passage like Matthew 5 that gives hope to the saints who name this king as Lord and share in his suffering. We hear a few of these. Blessed are those who grieve. So many losses, so many losses. And if you're in parish ministry, friends, you walk with people through multiple losses and you experience them yourself. Blessed are the meek. Now those are folks who take hits in a world where the take charge, get what you want, assert your rights are the values and slogans of the day. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In our world, that's probably considered naive. Doesn't play well at office parties. And in some cases, it will cost your life. Blessed are the merciful. In what is becoming an increasingly shaming, judging culture, mercy is not a value. And the list goes on. Blessed are those who make peace and often get creamed by both sides, who refuse to reconcile or to compromise. These are people who are trying to make their way faithfully in a broken world and getting beat up by that world and by its brokenness and by its distorted values. In ministry, our people are here. And don't be mistaken, friends. If you are not already there, you will find yourself there in ministry. You will experience compassion fatigue as you try to love people who are entrenched in negative patterns and addictive lifestyles. People whose behaviors and self-image are shaped by profound wounds. You will be wearied by divisions in the world that creep into the parish. You will tire of exposing and addressing the way the world's values continually creep into the parish and even into your own heart and actions. You will know the wounds received by criticism for just doing what you thought was the better way, the next right thing. Let alone living with your own failures that stem out of anxiety, insecurity, pride, and anger. Jesus is saying, if you find yourself in a state of brokenness and fatigue and exhaustion and being beat up for following me, you are in good company. The prophets were treated the same. The good news of this passage is the pain and the grief and the disappointment will not win. Matthew 5 is a word of hope found in the Messiah who has turned the power narratives of the world on its head by what he has taught, how he has lived, and how he has died. The life of all the saints is the testimony of the fruit of living his way and, yes, suffering for it. Jesus asserts his lordship when he proclaims a more final word than that brokenness and rebellion. This is not the end. The future, there is a future beyond this suffering. They will, as Revelation says, come out of this suffering. He acknowledges those who suffer as having a place and a future in his presence with him. They are not alone now, and they won't be in the future. He vindicates them for living faithfully and suffering as they seek to do so. And in the throne room, he himself is vindicated. Because what we see on the throne is a slain lamb. The one who turns the power narratives of the world is on the throne vindicated as the one who is Lord of all. 
The scenes of heaven from Revelation of John are the vindication of Jesus, the epitaph in powerful images. This is Jesus at his most righteous, the slain lamb. This is where the truest truths about him get their final and unmistakable and loudest yes and amen. The scope of all that he has and all that he has done as revealed for everyone to see and worship is the result. In chapter 7, there he is, front and center on the throne with the saints singing with raised hands, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then the great amen of the hosts of heaven. Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. But note this too. The praise in Revelation 7 of Jesus is both for that cosmic power and might and glory and for being shepherd and healer and provider. This praise is vindication of a king who serves and dies, a Lord who tenderly shepherds. We hear echoes of Matthew 5 when we find out who is represented in this congregation. Those who praise him have known him in the worst days of their lives, full of pain and fear and deep grief, oppression and injustice. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of their throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away the tear from their eyes. Do you hear that word of hope? You know, that picture in Revelation could just have been, it's all done and over. But that's not the revelation that's been given to us. Because we're still here. We're still here living as broken people in a broken world. And so what we're given in this, God, in, this, in this revelation of John is not just the triumph of a slain lamb, but the acknowledgement that those who have gone before through the tribulation, those who have suffered, now find healing. And that's a hope for us now. These are saints who have trusted the good shepherd of Psalm 23 and John 10 in their life. And now they know the fullness of his healing in his presence. His vindication is ours as we live now. His reign is our hope now. That's the hope we stand in. That's the hope we live in. When we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I don't know where you are in your engagement with the world and how it's left you bruised. Where you're dealing with your own fears or doubt or shame or anger and how it's left you exhausted. But this is the reigning slain lamb who is also shepherd. The vindication of his reign is the, the hope in which we stand even now, even when that reign is not complete and completely fulfilled. The shepherding presence we see for those who are gathered at the foot of that throne is the shepherding presence that is given to us even now. And the vindication there in that throne room, that living his way, this upside-down kingdom way, that's a vindication that enables us to get up tomorrow morning and do it again. Our shepherd king is on the throne, but he's still right now busy walking with us, wiping away tears, feeding hungry and thirsty souls, and sheltering us with his presence today in the hot mess of our world on November 3rd, 2021. 
and know that is powerful and beautiful as this picture is, the same Lord Jesus wants to walk with that same tenderness and power and glory in our lives right now. Amen. Thank you.